Okay, hello everybody and welcome back to our third session of our seminar on conceptions of time from the Big Bang to Daylight Savings. And I hope you all had a little time to catch your breath and have some lunch. Uh, I want to remind you that we will be having a number of in-person programs in the fall and we are still um, solidifying the schedule but we will be sending out some postcards in the summer, so watch your mail for some upcoming programs. I can tell you that, uh, apropos of Brandon's talk this morning on religious conceptions of time, we have a, a day-long program planned with Bart Ehrman on some of the themes he was talking about this morning. So we have themes on religion, we have some, we're gonna do a program on Beethoven, we, we have a lot of good programs coming, so just uh, watch uh, your mail for that. Um, I might mention one other thing. Uh, I will be away in the fall. I'll be on a leave in the fall, and Max Orr, our current executive director, will be the interim director during the fall semester, And um, but all of our programs will be continuing. So uh, this is our last program for the summer, but the fall will be coming soon. Time never stands still, if I may put it that way. So today, now in this session, we're going to expand our discussion to a much broader uh, framework of space and time through the insights of our third speaker, Adrian Erikcheck, who is an associate professor in our Department of Physics and Astronomy here at UNC Chapel Hill. And Professor Erikcheck received her AB in Physics at Princeton University and then completed a Master of Advanced Study in Mathematics at, um, let's see, at, and theoretical physics from the University of Cambridge. And then she went on to get her PhD in physics at the California Institute of Technology. She later held a postdoctoral fellowship at the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics at the University of Toronto. But she found her way eventually to UNC in 2013. There's a big universe out there but we're pleased that uh, Adrian has landed in this little corner of the galaxy to teach Carolina students and to pursue her research. Adrian's uh, published material from her research in numerous journals in the field of astrophysics and cosmology, and she has received a prestigious National Science Foundation Award for early career development. In addition to her research, she works with the Moorhead Planetarium to develop new curriculum materials for high school students. And she often speaks to non-specialist audiences about the history of the cosmos, exploring those themes where science and the humanities intersect. She's especially interested in scientific analysis of the origins of the universe and in how that long ago Big Bang might affect our views of the meaning of time. And these interests lead to the themes of her talk today, which is entitled, What is the Meaning of Time in the Galaxies of the Universe? So let's welcome Adrian. And, and let me just say one last time, Susan Landstrom is in the room, and for anyone who missed this morning's uh, session, I want you to know that this is Susan's last uh, CPH seminar after 960 previous seminars, and she gets an award for longevity, if I may use a time metaphor, but also extraordinary service. Thank you, Susan. And now, Adrian. Good afternoon. Uh, so I, I changed my title. I decided to say Astrophysical Perspective because I'm actually not going to talk that much about galaxies. I'm going to start with just, just talking about time and that time we can think of as the fourth dimension. Right, I'm supposed to stay put. This is going to be hard for me. <laughs> um, so time, in, our, in my view as an astrophysicist, is the fourth dimension. And it's not only the fourth dimension, it's kind of a warped fourth dimension. And this idea comes from Einstein. So first, let's just get used to the idea of time as a dimension. If I want to specify an event, it's not enough to tell you where it is. I just can't say Theater 9 at Silver Spot. If you showed up here tomorrow, you would miss my talk. 
If you want to know where an event is located, you have to specify four pieces of information. You need three locations in space, latitude, longitude, altitude, and you need to know what time to show up. So time is a coordinate that we need to specify events. Now, you already kind of know that space is relative. The example I have here is if you're on a train and you say to your traveling companion, back in the before times when we used to be allowed to travel on trains, meet me here in an hour. Well, according to the person on the train, sure, that makes sense. Meet me at this table in the dining car in one hour. But of course, to somebody standing outside the train, the dining car has moved a considerable distance in that hour, and so you're not meeting in the same place anymore. Motion is also relative. This is a picture of a famous race between a steam engine and a horse. The steam engine won. If you are on the steam engine, going slightly faster than the horse, you look out the window, what do you see? You see the horse moving backward. So is the horse moving forward or backward? It depends on your perspective. These are examples of a relative perception of space that we're all pretty used to. We know how this works. We know that when you're driving on the freeway and a car passes you, it looks like they're not going that fast because they're not going that fast relative to you. Now Einstein comes along in 1905 and tries to bring time into this picture. And so Einstein came up with two postulates. One is that the physics is the same in all reference frames that move at a constant velocity. This is basically saying that if you move at a constant velocity, it's just the same as if you weren't moving at all. And this is an extension of Newton. Newton told us that an object in motion will stay in motion and an object at rest will stay at rest. If you're on an airplane, back in the before times when we were allowed to go on airplanes, you didn't feel your motion that much. Once you took off, once you were in the air, you could easily, if you shut your eyes, shut your window, forget that you were moving at all until you hit a bunch of turbulence. Einstein is basically saying that on that airplane, no matter what physics experiment you do, it's going to be the same, as long as you don't run into turbulence, as if you did it on the ground. And a corollary to that is the idea that the speed of light in vacuum is the same in all reference frames because we knew from Maxwell's equations that the speed of light is just a number. It doesn't depend on who's doing the watching. This is very different from, say, a baseball. If I throw a baseball, and I'm no athlete, so I can't throw a baseball very fast. If I throw a baseball, and then I get on a, 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 a flatbed truck, dri somebody drives the truck, and I throw that baseball, the baseball is going to be going faster if I'm throwing it from a moving truck. That's not the way light works. Light always goes at the speed of light, no matter how fast the source is moving, no matter how fast you're moving relative to this source. You always measure the same speed of light. And this was a revolutionary concept. It had been experimentally demonstrated in 1887 to be true, but it wasn't until Einstein in 1905 that physicists finally we're able to kind of understand and grapple with the profound nature of this paradox about light. The first consequence, and I wonder if how many, uh, both at home and here, got to watch the little YouTube video I sent about the light clock. If the speed of light is the same for all observers, then it follows that moving clocks must run slower than stationary clocks. And what I have here is an illustration of what was shown in that, in that little short YouTube clip I sent out. Imagine I have a very basic clock that consists of just a laser beam going up and down, up and down, up and down, reflecting between two mirrors. If I'm stationary, that motion is just up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. But if I'm moving, what you see is it goes up at a diagonal and down at a diagonal as the ship is moving along. The diagonal path is longer than the straight up and down path. And so to the person who's seeing the ship move by, 
because they, say, they see the same speed but a longer distance, they conclude it takes a longer time for that light to go up and down than the person who's sitting on the spaceship just seeing it go straight up and down. This is not a matter of perception. This is an, a statement about the actual flow of time. To the person watching the ship go by, this process might take two seconds. But for the person on the ship, this process might only take one second. And that really means that for every two seconds that the person on Earth sees, the person on the ship only sees one second. They really are, clocks are moving slower for them because the speed of light is the same and the distance being traveled is different. As seen from Earth, a trip to the sun at 50% the speed of light takes 16 minutes. That's how long it takes to get to the sun if you're going half the speed of light. But for the astronauts on the ship, only 14 minutes will pass. However, both agree on how fast they're moving. So the only way to reconcile that is the astronauts on the ship must measure a shorter distance to the sun. Space is relative, too. So they, they say, yeah, we're going half the speed of light. It takes us 14 minutes. And the person on there said, no, 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 it took you 16 minutes. Well, they both agree they're going half the speed of light, so they must also agree on how far they traveled. What is the distance between the Earth and the sun? It's relative. It depends on how you're moving. So this is the crux of Einstein's special relativity, that if the speed of light is the same for everyone, then space and time are not. Distances and time change. So if I'm on a spaceship traveling from Earth to a space station, the observer on Earth will see that the ship is squished in the direction it's motion, and its clocks are running slow. Time is going slower on the ship than it is on Earth. But the person on the ship sees that, no, 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 my ship is perfectly fine. I'm fine. The distance between Earth and the space station is shorter, and their clocks are running slow. Moving clocks run slow, and it's totally a matter of opinion who's moving. This leads to a very famous twin paradox. One twin goes to a distant star, turns around, and then comes home. I just told you that moving clocks run slow. So according to the person who stayed home, the twin was moving. They should be younger. But according to the twin in the spaceship, no, 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 the Earth moved away and then back. So the Earth's clocks went slow. So when they finally meet again, who wins? Who's actually older? So I, I didn't want to do the hassle of setting up a Zoom probe. So I'm just going to ask for a raise of hands in the audience. And those of you at home, you know, think about your answer in your mind. Who thinks the astronaut twin is older? One vote for that. Who thinks the Earthbound twin is older? More votes for that. Who thinks they're the same age? Just cover a vote for that. And who ha says we just cannot know until we do this experiment? <laughs> a couple votes for that. So there is a, the, the answer to this one is that the Earthbound twin is older. And why? is because these two observers are not on equal footing. The Earth-pound twin sat here on Earth. The travel, the astronaut twin, had to go to the star and then turn around. The astronaut twin had to slow down, come to a halt, and then speed up in the opposite direction. That is not moving at a constant velocity. So turning around means that you're not moving at a constant velocity. You feel that. Just like when you slam on the brakes when you're driving and you f go forward, or you press on the gas and you go backward, you feel changes in velocity. And so that astronaut twin would definitely feel their spaceship making the U-turn. And as that U-turn is happening, they're outside of the realm of special relativity now, they would actually see the person on Earth aging faster, and they would agree that, yes, when I get back, 
that person's going to be older than I am because they aged really, really fast while I was turning around. So that is the resolution of the twin paradox. So there's another crazy consequence regarding time about this. Imagine I have a ladder. And my ladder is just a little bit too big for my garage. I can't, it doesn't fit. But I am a physicist, so I have a bright idea. If I move really fast, my ladder will shrink. And I'll be able to fit it into the garage. Of course, from the ladder's point of view, this makes no sense. If the ladder's moving, and, but from the ladder's point of view, it's the garage that's moving towards it. The garage has shrunk, and my problem is worse. So which is it? Does the ladder fit inside the garage or not? Another, another poll, think about this. How many people say, yes, it is possible to get the ladder into the garage this way? How many people say no? OK, most people said no. I didn't have any votes for yes. The answer is actually yes, from a certain point of view. I just watched um, Return of the Jedi last night with my five-year-old son for the first time. It was quite the experience. But yes, from a certain point of view, from the, pers from the garage's point of view, here's what can happen. The ladder comes in. The ladder fits inside the garage. For a moment, both doors shut. And for that instant, the ladder is indeed inside the garage. But then both doors open, the ladder keeps going. Remember, the ladder can't stop. The minute it stops, you know, it's gone. But from the ladder's point of view, they just see a different sequence of events. They see they come into the garage, the front door closes, the front door opens, the back door closes, the back door opens. It passes through, but the doors were never closed at the same time. They come to a nice halt, and they compare notes. And the person sitting on the garage says, hey, you did it. You fit. There was a time when the doors were both shut, and you were inside. The person running with the ladder says, no, that never happened. The doors were never shut at the same time. And this is what relativity says, that even order of events is subjective. According to one observer, the doors were shut at the same time. According to the observer, the doors were never shut at the same time. And there is no real right answer for these type of events, events that are, cannot cause each other, that have no communication between them. There's no set ordering. Some observers will see them happen at the same time. Some observers will see one, then the other. And the other, some observers will see the events in reverse. And there's no way to say who's right. These orderings just don't exist. So after completely smashing our concepts of time, that no, it does not click at a constant rate for everyone, and we can't even agree on what order events happen in, Einstein has another big idea. Coming back to our twin who turned around, and that feeling you have when you put the accelerator pedal down and you get pushed back into your chair, Einstein realized that acceleration and gravity are connected. That if you're in an, a box hanging above the Earth, you, fall, you drop something, it falls to the floor. The exact same thing happens if you're in a box that's accelerating upwards. You feel pressed down to the ground, just like you feel pressed down when you put that pedal to the metal and get thrown back in your chair. If you drop something, it's going to fall to the floor. Acceleration and gravity are the same thing. Another way to see this is if anybody has ever been on one of those um, amusement park rides where you, they drop you, a free fall ride, you feel weightless. For that instant while you're falling, you feel weightless. And if you drop something in front of you while you're falling, it just falls with you. It looks like it's hovering in front of you. Freely falling observers do not perceive gravity. This is actually what's going on when you look at astronauts in space. I teach general physics, and sometimes I ask you, is there gravity in space? A lot of people say no, because they're used to seeing the astronauts flying around. It's like, yeah, but then how's the Earth going around the sun? Of course there's gravity in space. 
Why do the astronauts float? Because they're falling. An astronaut in orbit is constantly falling. They're in a state of free fall. Their entire ship is in a state of free fall. And so inside the ship, it looks like there's no gravity at all. This led Einstein to his next really big idea, that gravity is not a force. Gravity is a manifestation that space-time is curved. Mass tells space-time how to curve, and space-time then tells mass how to move. Mass wants to move in a straight line, but on a curved warp surface, sometimes a straight line isn't so straight. It can be a circle, an orbit. It can be falling to the ground. We live in a warped space-time, and that is what gravity actually is. And that is Einstein's theory of gravity, and it works really well. But it had an unwanted consequence for Einstein. Very quickly on, Einstein realized he had a problem. And he had a problem with time. In general relativity, the universe cannot sit still. So in Newtonian gravity, when you think about gravity as forces, if you have an equal distribution of you know, masses, then the mass I've drawn here in the center is pulled equally in all directions, as, is all the, uh, all, as are all the other little masses, and everything can just sit still. But that doesn't work in general relativity. The combined effect of all the mass will cause space itself to contract. Everything will get closer together. Einstein realized this, and he thought this was a big problem. Because Einstein was sure that the universe was eternal that it had always been exactly as it is. There was no beginning, that the universe was static. He wanted the universe to be beyond time. And so he fudged the math. He didn't like the answer his equations were giving him. So he actually put in a new term, this cosmological term, into his equations to fudge it, to make it work, to make it so that it was possible for the universe to sit still and be eternal and unchanging. Now, very early on, some other physicists came up with the idea, well, maybe that's wrong. Maybe the universe doesn't sit still. In 1922, Alexander Friedman came up with an alternative, a dynamical universe, an expanding universe. Einstein was a genius. He is one of my favorite physicists of all time. I respect him more than I possibly respect any historical figure. But the one thing he was terrible at was judging other people's work. So in 1922, he looks at Friedman's work and he says, it's wrong. In 1923, he admits, OK, fine, it's mathematically correct, but hardly of physical significance. Friedman, unfortunately, died rather young in 1925. A few years later, a Catholic monk, and I think the fact that he was a Catholic monk played into this, Jorge Lamatra independently formulated an expanding universe as an answer to this problem. And he showed that it was compatible with some known observations of galaxies. So what did Einstein say about this? A quote that Lamatra said later, after a few favorable technical remarks, he concluded by saying that from a physical point of view, this looked to him to be abominable. They did not like this idea. They did not like the idea that their universe was changing. Because if it's changing, that means there was a beginning. Now, in 1929, Edwin Hubble makes a very big splash. This is now data. What we've got on this axis is velocity. It should be kilometers per second. There was a typo in the original paper. This is velocity. This is distance. These points are galaxies. And Hubble saw that there was a linear relationship, that the velocity was equal to some constant that we call Hubble's constant times the distance. Objects are moving away from us, proportional to how far away they are from us. The universe is dynamical. 
things are moving and everything is moving away from us. Now, up to this point, astronomy had been for a long time an exercise in humility. We started out thinking the Earth was the center of the universe. And then, no, 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 it wasn't the Earth, the Sun. The Sun is the center of the universe. Actually, no, the Sun is kind of in the you know, moderate suburbs of a galaxy. But that galaxy is the center of the universe. Except, no, that galaxy is actually just one of billions of galaxies in the universe. We're not special. Well, the only way we were going to make our peace with that is if we're not special, then nobody's special. And so it's a postulate in cosmology that we see this expansion. We're going to assume that everybody else sees the exact same thing we do. Of course, we, don't have, we can't go test that. We can't go to the neighboring galaxy and check. Do they see the same Hubble's law as we do? We're going to assume that's true. And if that's true, then the way to interpret Hubble's finding is an expanding universe. And this is how Lamatra understood it. The universe is expanding. And I want to take some time with this concept because there's a lot of misconceptions out there about what it means that the universe is expanding. And I, I actually sent out an article talking about some of those misconceptions. This is not a case of stuff flying out into empty space, like an explosion. This is the creation of space between all objects. So the way I like to illustrate this is imagine you have a grid through space. This grid is infinite. It goes in all directions. I'm just limited here by the size of even this big screen. So this grid goes in all directions equally. And there are galaxies at points in this grid. The expansion of the universe means that the grid lines themselves are moving apart from each other. So the galaxies are staying at the same points on the grid, but the space between the grid lines is increasing with time. And so if we look at how this movie progresses, if I'm sitting in this galaxy, this is 8 billion years ago, I see these other galaxies, I go a little bit further in time, and you can see the galaxies have all moved away from me, and they've moved away from me at a velocity proportional to their distance, just like Hubble saw. And I get to today, and they're further apart from me. The key is I see the exact same thing if I'm sitting in this galaxy. In this galaxy, all the other galaxies have moved away from me via Hubble's law. And there's no center, and there's no edge. It's an infinite grid in all directions. It's just the spacing between the grid lines is changing with time. So it's not an explosion into empty space. It is the creation of space. And that is the expansion of the universe. Now, I can play this backwards. And I can say, OK, if I play this movie backwards to its logical conclusion, I come to the conclusion that 13.8 billion years ago, the spacing between those grid lines was zero. The grid lines were all on top of each other. There's still an infinite number of grid lines. They're just infinitely close to each other. This is what we call the Big Bang. So where did the Big Bang happen? By definition, it happened everywhere. The Big Bang was that point in time when the separation between any two points in the universe was zero, that the entire universe had effectively zero extent. And it had happened at a set time, 13.8 billion years ago. This was not a popular idea. Sir Arthur Eddington, 1931, said, philosophically, the notion of a beginning of the present order of nature is repugnant to me. And for many years, from the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, into the 70s, there was an alternative model called the steady state universe that still had the same grid, but postulated the creation of new matter in the empty grid cells so that the universe kind of stays in a steady state, even though things were expanding. That way, you never had to deal with the fact that there was a beginning. However, that idea lost. The data has come in, and the data is overwhelmingly persuasive 
that as repugnant as it may be to Sir Arthur Eddington, the universe really is 13.8 billion years old. There really was a moment of something that happened that set our universe into motion. And so that brings me, let me see how I'm doing on time here. That brings me to part two, the evolving universe. As an astronomer, I have a tool that my historian colleagues can only envy. When I look in a telescope, I actually get to look back in time. I bet Lloyd would really love to have a camera that he could look to and actually watch the French Revolution in real time. I have that. The speed of light gives me that. When I look out with my telescope, I don't see things as they are now. I see things as they were when that light was emitted. Now for the stars around us, that means I'm seeing the stars as they were years ago. The nearest star to us is four light years away. I'm seeing it as it was four years ago. The most distant stars in our galaxy are 65,000 light years away. I'm seeing them as they were 65,000 years ago. They could have blown up since then. I wouldn't know. We can go further out and look at other galaxies and see them as they were billions of years ago. We can look out further at these, for these objects called luminous red galaxies. These are the brightest galaxies. And we can see what they looked like hundreds, uh, sorry, like four billion, five billion years ago. We can see quasars, which are the black holes at the center of galaxies. We can see those out as they were close to 13 billion years ago. Now notice something, these numbers are starting to diverge. We can see quasars that are currently 28 billion light years away, even though the universe is only 13.8 billion years old. And that's because the light that they emitted was emitted back when they were closer to us. So they emitted the light we're seeing and then continued moving away from us. So they're further away now. We're seeing them as they were long ago when they were still closer to us. So we can see them. And the furthest out we can see is the cosmic microwave background. And that basically takes us to the edge of the observable universe. And I'll talk in a minute what that is. So we have this tool. We can actually look back in time directly. This helps us understand how the universe is evolving. The next concept, and I promise this is my one equation, how is how does the content of the universe change as the universe expands? So imagine I've got a bunch of rocks in a box. And I expand my box, but I keep the amount of stuff the same. The density inside that box is the mass of each particle times their number over their volume. So if I've increased the volume of my box, the density has gone down. The universe is getting emptier as it expands. The universe is constantly getting emptier. Now imagine that instead of rocks, I have photons, light. Their number density is diluted in the same way, one over volume. But something else happens to them, too. The wavelength of the light actually gets stretched by the expansion of the universe. So the light gets redder, less energetic. And so the energy density and the radiation falls off faster. It's not only going as one over volume, it gets an extra factor because each individual photon is losing energy. This means that the universe gets colder as it expands, emptier and colder. So if we go backwards in time, what we find is that a young universe is a hot universe. So today, today we're 13.8 billion years after the Big Bang. 70% of the universe is dark energy. We don't know what it is. We just know it's there. About 30% of the universe is matter. And if we go backwards in time, the matter density increases. So forward in time, the matter density is falling. And the radiation density is falling even faster. Today, there's not much radiation left. And the temperature of the universe is only 2.7 degrees above absolute zero, 2.7 Kelvin. 
However, if we go back in time, 100 seconds after the Big Bang, it is 100% radiation, and the temperature is 1 billion Kelvin. This is as hot as the inside of the sun. The entire universe was as hot as the inside of the sun. Now some fun things happen when you go inside the sun. So here's my history of the universe. Here we are today. You go back in time. And the event I want to talk about next is right here, two to three minutes after the Big Bang, when the temperature was 1 billion degrees Kelvin. This, we had nuclear fusion, protons and neutrons combining to form helium. This is exactly the same reaction that makes the sun shine. This is why the sun shines, as this is going on inside the sun. The universe was as hot as the inside of the sun. And so the entire universe was undergoing nuclear fusion, just like the sun does. And so we go out and we measure how much helium is there in the universe. And when we measure this, this is the percentage of matter in helium. We measure that about 23% of the matter in the universe the atomic matter in the universe is in helium. The rest of it's basically in hydrogen. 23% in helium is far, far, far more helium than all the stars that have ever lived could possibly produce. This is the helium that came from the Big Bang. And it precisely matches our models for how much helium there should be from the Big Bang. This was one of the first triumphs of the Big Bang theory. The next big event to happen in the universe, so now the universe gets colder, it's colder. Now we're 380,000 years after the Big Bang. The temperature has cooled to only 3,000 degrees Kelvin. Still hot, but not inside the sun hot. You know, kind of kitchen flame hot. Maybe, maybe high density furnace hot. At that temperature, atoms were able to form for the very first time. So before that, you just had free electrons and free nuclei flying around. It was too hot for them to form atoms. If they tried, they'd get immediately knocked apart. But at this temperature, it finally became cold enough that that was no longer true. And all the electrons could find little protons and helium and make atoms. This was a profound moment in the universe's history. Because before that, it was an ionized plasma, like flame. You can't see through flame. You can, however, see through helium and hydrogen. They're transparent. This is when the universe became transparent. This is when the universe went from being a fireball to being clear. And the light that was getting knocked around in that fireball just started going in straight lines. And it goes in straight lines until it reaches my telescope. So this is the illustration of you've got you know, the photons. They're bouncing off these ionized particles. And then this transition happens. Atoms form. And those photons travel the distance to reach us. And we observe them today. This is the cosmic microwave background. So this is a movie I stole from NASA. They, they make nice movies like this. Here we are cruising through our galaxy. We're going to come up on the Earth. There's Earth. We see a sky around us. So we make a map of the sky around us. And we can unfold that map into a projection. And you see our galaxy there along the middle. And now we're not going to look in visible light. We're going to look into colder and colder and colder and colder light. And we get down to the microwave. It's just this uniform glow until we dial up the contrast and we start to see these little hot spots and cold spots. The red band in the middle is the galaxy. Ignore that. I'm not really interested in that. This is the cosmic microwave background. It is literally a snapshot of what the universe looked like 380,000 years after the Big Bang. When we see this light, we are seeing light that has been traveling to us undisturbed since the creation of hydrogen in the early universe. And so we basically have this baby picture of the universe. And it tells us a lot. 
this is what it looks like now. This is the most up-to-date. And it turns out that this pattern of hot spots and cold spots is consistent with this all just being quantum mechanics. That quantum mechanics tells us that if you zoom in enough, space isn't smooth. It's kind of bumpy and foamy. And what we're seeing is that foam imprinted on the universe. Once we understand that, it's pretty easy to get the rest of the history of the cosmos. This is a simulation starting with the light spots here are places with a little bit more matter than average. The dark spots are places with a little bit less matter than average. And then we move that simulation forward. Gravity is the universe's great construction agent. Gravity likes to pull everything together. So if I've got a little more, more stuff over here, gravity's going to pull it in. So I get even more stuff in that location. And you can see that's what's happening. My overdense regions are becoming o more overdense. My underdense regions are emptying out. Here's four, a few billion years later. You can see I've got this kind of filament and voids. And then here's what it looks like today. And this matches what we see in the distribution of galaxies. Galaxies are distributed in this kind of web-like structure, the cosmic web. What does this look like kind of locally in real time? I've got a movie here. This movie does have an edge, but that's just because you know a finite computer has to have a boundary. So you're going to see kind of an edge expanding out, which I just told you that's not what the Big Bang was. That's just because the simulation has an edge that's expanding out. So you're going to see particles expanding out in all directions. But then look at the center. You're going to start to see some particles turning around and falling back in. So there's the expansion. But then if you look at the center, you see the particles trying to fall back in. And now we've got kind of a clump of matter in the center that's no longer expanding. That's where we live. That's our galaxy. So the galaxy is not expanding. The galaxy is a gravitationally bound collection that is stable. But the space between galaxies is still increasing. Now, back to Einstein and this idea of general relativity. I told you before, mass curves space-time. Space-time tells mass how to move. That's how gravity works. The cosmological corollary to that is that the content of the universe determines how the universe expands. So if I have here the size of the universe as a function of time, the orange curve shows you how it would expand if it was just filled with radiation. The matter curve shows you how it would expand if it was filled with matter. Notice both of these, the expansion is slowing down. That makes sense. Gravity is trying to pull everything together. So whatever initial expansion you have, gravity is trying its best to get everything back together. It was an incredible shock in 1997, 1998, when we looked at how distant supernovae are moving away from us, we discovered that they're not slowing down. They're getting faster. They look more like this yellow curve. This is what you get when you have dark energy. And this is why we are forced to admit that we do have dark energy. The expansion of the universe is actually speeding up. There's something pulling things apart, some kind of anti-gravity force that we have named dark energy, but we don't really understand it at all. So here's our new content of the universe that I, I showed before, but this is, this is what we've got today. A little bit of radiation. 4% of the universe is atoms. 26% is dark matter. That's matter we don't understand. 70% is dark energy. That's the stuff that we really, really don't understand. And when we look at how these quantities are evolving, here we are today. If we look in the future, now we're going towards the end times, the future belongs to dark energy. Dark energy is just hanging out here flat. Dark energy's unique property is that you expand the universe, you get more dark energy. 
It's basically an energy density associated with space itself. Sometimes it's called vacuum energy. And it's just hanging out there constant. And so if we go forward in time, right now it's 70% of the universe's energy density. Going forward, it's going to quickly become 100%. So the future of the universe belongs to dark energy. So this becomes the big question. What exactly is dark energy doing? As far as we can tell, it's holding steady. It's going flat. If it is indeed constant, or if it's decreasing slightly, so slightly we haven't been able to detect, detect it yet, then the fate of the universe is one of emptiness. Galaxies will continue to get further and further apart, but individual galaxies will stay intact. So our little local group, the Milky Way, is currently on a collision course with another galaxy, Andromeda. They are going to collide in about 5 billion years. They will merge into a single galaxy, and then that galaxy will become an isolated galaxy. We will lose sight of all the other galaxies. The CMB will get so cold, we won't see it anymore, and cosmology will effectively be over. It's very important we leave good records for future cosmologists, because eventually you're not going to be able to see anything beyond our galaxy. It's a lonely, cold existence. The other alternative is maybe dark energy is increasing slightly. That leads to a scenario called the Big Rip, where eventually dark energy becomes powerful enough to rip galaxies apart. And then it becomes powerful enough to rip star systems apart. And then it becomes powerful enough to rip rocks apart. And then it becomes powerful enough to rip atoms apart. And in possibly as soon as, given current measurements, 50 billion years, give or take, Everything gets ripped apart, and this is a big rip. The universe basically goes to infinite um, separation in finite time. We don't know which of these scenarios is going to happen because, as far as we can tell, dark energy is just holding steady, but it's possible it's moving a little bit in either direction, and we're working on figuring out exactly how. I do want to note that, you know, I've been talking big rip, 50 billion years. We on Earth, we have bigger problems. The sun is not eternal. The sun is dynamical. Suns are born and suns die. And here is where we are on the life cycle of our sun. We are here. The sun is gradually getting hotter, such that in about a billion years, the sun's energy output will increase by 10%. The oceans will boil, and this will be the end of complex life on Earth. Now, this is in a billion years, 10% in a billion years. Any warming that has been happening in the last 200 years is not due to this. <laughs> this is a much, much, much slower time scale. So don't let anybody tell you, well, yes, the sun gets warmer as it ages, and that's what's causing global warming. No. Yes, the sun gets warmer as it ages, but not on the time scale of 200 years. In 200 years, the sun has not done anything. But in a billion years, we're going to have problems. And by this point, I mean, the Earth is like fully, fully cooked. This is, you know, this is the end of all life. And then the sun's going to expand as it runs out of fuel into a red giant, and the Earth will actually be consumed by the expanding sun. So that's the end of the Earth. So I wanted to just conclude there with this idea that we've got a dynamical universe that's evolving. And I like this graphic. This puts the entire history of the universe on a calendar. So January 1st, midnight, is the Big Bang. And the first four months is the cosmic dark ages until the Milky Way forms. Basically, we've got galaxies forms. The Earth and the Sun form in September. Starting in December, things start to get interesting on Earth. By the time we get to December 14th, we've got the first signs of life on Earth. December 29th, we've got the major dinosaurs, the, the epitome of the dinosaurs, the tyrannosaurids. On December 30th, the dinosaurs go extinct, the mammals get to take over. Humans show up eight minutes before the end of the year. So all of human history, not even, and human prehistory even, is in the last eight minutes. 
And then the written record, written history, is just in this last minute, where each second lasts 434 years. And so, you know, Columbus arrived in America 1.2 seconds ago. World War II was 0.2 seconds ago. And here we are at the end of the calendar. So this gives you a bit of perspective. Um, yes, the universe is finite. And yes, it has a finite age. However, the universe is very old. And we are very new on the scene. And I will end there. Thank you. OK, thank, thank you very much. I, I feel like there's no reason to rush to the end of this session, but we do. <laughs> but we're, we're going to run out of time eventually. Um, I have a, a, there are a couple of questions that have come in, and there may be also questions in, in the room. Well, why don't we start with a couple of questions in the room, and then I'll come back to the Zoom. We're, we're moving between two worlds. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you and me both. Uh, so okay, we so need the question to. Was, the question was, can I go back to January 1st and explain the Big Bang? Why are we here at all? No, I can't. Um, the truth is, we don't know. So here's what we do know. General relativity is Einstein's theory of gravity. It describes gravity really, really, really well. It does not play well with quantum mechanics which is another very successful theory we have that governs the very small. When you try to put general relativity with quantum mechanics, it's like oil and water. They just don't like each other. That you get, it just doesn't work. And physicists have been working for the past literally 100 years to get these two things to talk to each other and come up with a unified theory of quantum gravity. We don't have it yet. Fortunately, there are only two places in the universe where you need it. Because for the most part, gravity works on really, really big things. Quantum mechanics works on really, really small things. So there's only two places in the universe where you actually need a theory where you've got gravity in a small space. One of them is inside a black hole, and the other is the beginning of the universe, when you had a lot of stuff in a small space. So without a theory of quantum gravity, I don't really know how to say what started it. There's a lot of ideas. Um, when there's an idea called inflation that uh, maybe we are, an uh, idea called eternal inflation, rather, where the universe is eternal, and our universe is just a little bubble, a little pocket of the universe that broke off and stopped expanding inflationarily. And is cooling and having this little evolution. And there are other bubbles. And these little bubbles are constantly popping out via quantum effects. It's possible. Well, then you, don't, then, then you get back to the universe that Eddington wanted. Then you get back to a universe that was always thus, that had no beginning. So then, then you, if, you, if you do postulate that universe that is always expanding, always eternal, eternal expansion, then you can, via quantum mechanics, predict that there would be bubbles, that quantum mechanics would create a bubble, just like when you heat water, bubbles emerge. Um, and so you can do that. But we don't have any definitive evidence that's the way it went. Um, and like I said, my view is that until we have a really good theory of quantum gravity, trying to ask what exactly happened at the Big Bang, we're, it's, it's basically out of our wheelhouse. We don't have the physics to describe it. So we're left with this eternal question, why does something exist rather than nothing at all? And, and you don't yet have that no. answer, but no, we're going to keep working on it. And um, it, is <laughs> it is a huge question. We'll have another question back. Yeah, go ahead. The question is, have there been any successful attempts to see dark matter? We detect dark matter via its gravity. So we know it's there because of the way it gravitates. If you look at the way stars move in galaxies, you can infer from that how much matter there must be inside the galaxy based on the way the stars are moving. 
and the amount of matter you get from that is a lot more than the matter we see. So that was kind of the first indication of dark matter. Since then, by looking at the cosmic microwave background, this snapshot of the universe, we see very clearly in that cosmic microwave background that some of the matter was part of the plasma that was talking to the photons, the ionized atoms. And some of the matter was not. Some of the matter was already gravitationally clumping. That means that it's not made of atoms. It's made of something completely else, something that's not on the periodic table. That's dark matter. So we see dark matter via gravity. Gravity tells us that dark matter's there. Now, there have been numerous, 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 numerous attempts to see it more directly. To catch it, not, nothing yet. Nothing yet. The only evidence we have for it is gravitational at this time. Um, there's a lot of hope and a lot of effort to try to see it. Um, basically, that if you have like a vat of ultra pure gas, every so often there should be dark matter particles streaming through us all the time right now. Um, they just don't interact very much. But every once in a while, maybe they would, and we could see. We could see the rebound when they hit something. And so we've been looking for many, 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 many years, and nothing yet. Um, there's also a lot of theory that dark matter, there's a good reason to think that dark matter is its own antiparticle. So if you get two dark matter particles together, they collide and, ex and explode and shine light. And we've been looking for that and haven't seen that yet either. Um, if you had asked uh, 10 years ago, I was so confident we were going to see dark matter in the next 10 years because the experiments were getting to the region where we really thought we'd see it. We haven't. And it's, 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 uh, it's getting disconcerting. It's getting increasingly uncomfortable. I really thought we would have seen it by now. So I'm going to bring in some of our community that's watching from Absolutely. all around. I, I have to begin with a comment from Joe Sitter who says, I just finished a six-part astrophysics lecture series on much the same topic with 75-minute sessions, six 75-minute sessions. You just did a superior job explaining multiple hard-to-understand concepts in one session. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Do you ever explain to fellow science professors how to communicate these hard-to-understand concepts to other people? Um, I don't know. I mean, I would hope maybe by example. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, well, we'll set that one aside. Let me. <laughs> so I just take that as a sign that you reach somebody out there in Zoom land. We're living in virtual space right here. Absolutely. So here's a question. When you look through telescopes and see galaxies as they were billions of years ago, yet stars closer to Earth as more recent, does that mean you'd see a warped universe with more expansion closer to Earth and less expansion further from Earth? So it kind of depends. So, so I don't need to repeat the question, right? Because you have I think mic. that question came through, yes. Okay. Um, so it kind, of sp it, it kind of depends on exactly what you mean by expansion. So first of all, the galaxies inside our galaxy, the, the stars inside our galaxy, they are not expanding. Our galaxy is not expanding. Our galaxy is staying you know, gravitationally bound, a gravitationally bound collection of stars. So when we look at the stars in our galaxy, they're just orbiting. They're orbiting the galaxy. Some of them are moving towards us. Some of them are moving away from us. Um, and so we don't see the expansion of the universe. We're looking at stars inside our own galaxy. If you look at stars in other galaxies, then, and then the stars, you know, more galaxies even more distant, and then supernova even further out. They're bright, so we can see them farther out. Indeed, then we can start putting together kind of extension of that Hubble diagram I showed, where we can s talk about how bright something appears compared to how far away we think it is. Mm -hmm. And that's actually how we learn about the expansion of the universe. That's how we discovered dark energy. That yes, by doing that, we can see that the things that are far, far, far away from us actually appear fainter than they nominally should. And what that's telling us is that the expansion of the universe used to be slower, and now it's expanding faster. And that's how we discovered dark energy. So by looking at you know, how things are moving at varying distances away from us, that's how we understand and learn about the expansion of the universe and what the universe contains. So um, 
This is another question related to dark energy um, from Charlotte Bro. Where do black holes fall in the configuration of dark energy, radiation, and matter? What what what, what where, where the, do dark, where do black holes where, where fall is in the that? role of what is the role of the dark holes? Uh, black the black holes. holes. It depends. It depends on where your black holes came from. So the black holes that we know exist are dead stars. Hmm. So big stars, bigger than the sun. The sun will not become a black hole, but a star that's bigger than our sun. When it runs out of fuel, when it can no longer fuse. It's going, basically the engine shuts off. And all this time, it's been that engine that has been preventing, that has basically been keeping the star intact. And when that engine shuts off, gravity takes over and squeezes. Everything just falls in. Mm -hmm. And if it's a big star, it creates a black hole. So those are the black holes that we have seen, the black holes that we have detected via various ways, we think come from that origin, that they are dead stars. So in my budget of the cosmological pie chart, here, they would fall into atoms. They're dead stars. So they're not atoms anymore, but in terms of from my cosmological pers perspective, until very recently, they were atoms. And now they're dead stars, and now they're black holes. Mm -hmm. However, there's an alternative that maybe there were some black holes that were actually created either at the Big Bang or shortly thereafter. These are called the primordial black holes. We do not know whether or not whether these exist. But if they did exist, they could be dark matter. So they are one idea for what the dark matter could be, mm -hmm. is black holes that were there from the beginning times, not dead stars. And so then those would be a candidate for dark matter. So these stars that have died, so to speak, They've, they may have already lasted six or eight or ten billion years out of this 13.8 billion, but they died. Well, so the thing about stars is they, they burn bright, live short. So big stars have short lives. Okay. Small stars get to live a long time. As stars, the bigger you are, the faster you burn your fuel, the shorter your life. Bright and die. So the stars that form black holes, they usually have lifetimes less than, less than a few million years. Um, okay. But they're constantly forming. There are new stars forming all the time. So they form, they, they burn bright, large, hot, die, form black holes. New stars form. So that's why our sun, which, what, was four or five billion years old, it hasn't burned out yet because it's a small star. It's, a rel it's not the smallest star out there, but it's, it's, a, it's kind of a medium star. Yeah, so we're, we have, which is good news for us because it's not going to go anywhere soon. No, no, and it's, it's I, but... <laughs> It's, it's so um, it's, a, it's an interesting question. There are some stars that can live stably for literally hundreds of millions of years. So if you had life around those stars, they might look at something like our sun and say, oh, no, 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 it's going to burn out in like less than 10 billion years. There's no way life could form around such an unstable star. So, yeah, we look at the bigger stars and say, oh, yeah, those things only live for, you know, a few million years. There's no way life could form around a star that's only around for a few million years. I, I, I'll, I'll yield to my colleagues in astrobiology to say, you know, who's right on that perspective. But, yes, our sun is a kind of middleweight star. It, it has a lifetime of about 8 billion years, and it will then turn into a white dwarf when it dies. Mm -hmm. Gravity won't win. It won't turn into a black hole. So I have an, another question here. This is from uh, Paul. At the time of the Big Bang, is it theorized that the elements you identified, matter, dark matter, dark energy, uh, or any of them, existed but in a single point? That is, did, did all of these things already exist within this highly compressed, about to bang <laughs> uh, place. I, I mean, I, I guess I don't know how that's, to describe that's a, it. That's, a, that's an excellent question. <laughs> that's actually a major focus of my research is I, I spend a lot of time thinking about where dark matter came from. Um, I'm going to say that my, my and I would say the majority of cosmological thought would agree no. That our universe actually went through a phase between what we called here the Big Bang and today, um, a phase called inflation. 
And if this were a different public lecture, I could give a whole public lecture on inflation and why, and why we think it happened. But it's basically an instant of very, very, very rapid expansion. And it solves a lot of problems in cosmology. It helps kind of erase what happened at the Big Bang. So it kind of hides our ignorance. That's why one of the reasons we like it. It also basically sets things up perfectly for the way we observe things to be. And inflation needed the universe to be filled with an exotic, almost dark energy-like substance, which we have called the inflaton, because we don't know what it is. And um, so the, in, in, my th in, in current theory, and my, my, the, the theory I and most cosmologists subscribe to, the universe started out filled with the inflaton. And then the inflaton decayed and created dark matter, matter, normal matter, periodic table, atomic matter, radiation. And then once you have radiation, normal matter, maybe you could create dark matter from that. Um, you kind of end up with a primordial soup that everything is making everything else. Mm -hmm. um, and we already know that this can happen, that if you, have, you know, if, you have a, if you have a photon that's energetic enough, it can split into an electron-positron pair. And so you can make matter from light, and you can make light from matter. So you start off with this kind of primordial soup that everything came out from. OK, so, uh, so Paul should continue to follow your research, in other words, because maybe you'll I, be like able said, to. I, <laughs> asking the question of what exactly happened in that kind of genesis coming uh, out of inflation into yeah. the hot Big Bang, that's my, that's my favorite period of the universe. That's the period of the universe. So that's I like the, the first uh, uh, seconds the of first this. The first second. So <laughs> you're going back 13.8 billion years and in your research. Boy, that second. is humbling for a historian. Um, here's another question. Does the concept of dark energy come from the mathematics of theory, which have not yet, but not yet actually observed, or is it developed into a mathematics of theory from observations? Dark energy is something nobody wanted. Uh oh. <laughs> so let's see. I, I want to no. there. Yeah. So up until basically when Einstein finally saw the light and said, OK, yes, the universe is expanding, he got together with his friend de Sitter, and they formulated the mathematics behind a universe filled with matter, the einstein de Sitter universe. This is the cosmologist's favorite universe. Not only does it make a lot of sense, it's filled with matter. We see matter. Matter's good. But it's also like so mathematically elegant, you can like calculate everything. This is the universe that exists in cosmology exams when I need to, my students to be able to do stuff with pencil and paper. It's the universe we thought we lived in until the late 90s. But in the late 90s, the data started coming in, multiple avenues. Um, one of the first warning shots was the age of the universe predicted from Einstein to Sitter was about 11.8 billion years old. And we were finding stars older than that. Mm -hmm. That was embarrassing for the cosmologists. When, you, when the astronomers are coming out and saying, we found a star that's 12.5 billion years old. We're like, uh, no, no, <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> that's older than the universe, no. <laughs> um, so that was one problem. Uh, and we started seeing more problems, more indications that all was not right, um, that there was something else, something missing. But then in, in 1998, 1997, uh, these distant supernova observations really definitively showed that the expansion of the universe is not slowing down, it is speeding up. And the way you explain that is by putting in dark energy. That's the only way to explain it in the context of general relativity. Now, it is possible that maybe it, this, is, this is a fudge. This is maybe telling us something about gravity. And I've worked on that in the past, that could this be a sign that general relativity is not the end-all, be-all theory of gravity. Is this, this is basically saying general relativity made a prediction. General relativity predicted that if the universe is filled with matter, it should be slowing down. We see the universe is not slowing down. So does that mean general relativity is wrong or that we aren't filled with matter? The dominant thinking right now is it means we're not filled with matter. We've got dark energy. But maybe it's just a sign that general relativity is wrong. Um, and there's been a lot of work done on exploring that idea. Nothing terribly compelling yet, I must say. The, the type of gravity theories that you have to invent to explain this actually end up looking a lot like dark energy when you squint. Hmm. Dark energy in a different mathematical framework. So I would say dark, dark energy 
is our explanation for the observations, but it's nothing we wanted. It's something the yeah. universe forced on us. So it's a way to account for something that couldn't be otherwise accounted for. Exactly. Observations so, we didn't know how to explain. So uh, this is a, a question about the resistance to the idea that there was a beginning point. Uh, do you think that the uh, people like Einstein and others resisted this because it came too close to a religious explanation for the beginning of time or the beginning of the universe? I think so. I and think they really didn't like the idea of a moment of creation. They wanted this to be eternal. They wanted this to be twas ever thus. And if you have a, you know, a, an event, it, it's, it's a very natural cause that, okay, so what triggered it? What was before? What was, mm -hmm. you know, what was the cause? And yeah, I think they were deeply uncomfortable so, with how, like I said, I do not think it was a, it a coincidence that the Big Bang's first major proponent and inventor was a Catholic monk. I think he liked this idea very much. <laughs> so it actually gets back to the question of a prime mover, which of course in philosophical terms has been one of the arguments for the existence of God. Exactly. So I could see where then it just moves it back instead of seven days, it's 13.8 billion 13 years. 13.8 billion years. It's just, we're just talking a difference in, <laughs> in I, the scale. I, I find it, I, I've, I've given public lectures before, and, and depending on the audience, sometimes I get a little pushback or a little, at least question about, you know, what does this mean for faith or what does this mean for, and, and I always, I, it amuses me to some extent when, when, uh, uh, people who, who are of a religious persuasion and want there to be a moment of creation resist the Big Bang because it's like, no, 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 this is it. <laughs> you the Big Bang a is, a, is an ally. This yes. is it. And yeah. believe me, a lot of people are uncomfortable with that. But I, I, I cannot deny that 13.8 billion years ago, something happened. Mm -hmm. Something very profound happened in our universe 13.8 billion years ago. Um, it was not always thus. So then we're back to the question of how it got started. You know, in the Enlightenment, they called it the great watchmaker who, who set up the watch <laughs> and get, left it ticking. This is the metaphor of the day for our <laughs> seminar. Uh, the great bang theory is a way of saying the watchmaker got to work and there was an explosion and we've been living with it tick tock ever since. Um, you know, we've come past our closure time here, so we're going to adjourn for a minute. Uh, we're going to set up uh, some chairs, and we're going to have a final panel discussion starting in about nine or ten minutes. But could everyone join with me online and in the room in thanking uh, Adrian uh, Erichek for a wonderful, wide-ranging presentation. Thank you. And we'll be right back uh, after we set up the chairs.